All right, day three of the Democratic National Convention in Chicago. Thank you, Governor. It's great to be here, Josh. Obviously, this could have been a very different convention just a couple weeks ago. How's everything going? It's exciting, Josh. I mean, here, you know, uh, we've had uh, Barack Obama and Michelle Obama speak yesterday. Uh, we have Tim Walz tonight, Kamala Harris tomorrow. This, this is exciting. There's so much real grassroots enthusiasm and excitement about uh, putting the chaos and division of the past behind us and really focusing on the future-oriented leadership of Kamala Harris. One thing I wanted to ask you about before we look forward is just to briefly look back. And uh, I know you had a phone call with uh, a lot of other Democratic governors and President Biden before he dropped out of the race to kind of hear what he was going to do when a lot of Democrats wanted to know. Did you get a sense in that call that he might get to a place where he would drop out? Well, look, I'm, I'm thrilled that he made the decision he did. That's an intense and personal process. Nobody gets to make that decision for Joe Biden. And uh, I'm sure he took into account not only what he heard from me and the other governors, but what he heard from so many of his friends and allies over the years. He thought about it long and hard. and. He made the right decision for the country. And you saw the, the love the people here in Chicago offered Joe Biden. I mean, a four minute standing ovation, absolutely incredible. Uh, and really celebrating his legacy on the first night of the DNC. Because it takes so much time to address housing affordability, how can Democrats and Kamala Harris really let voters know that they, they care about this issue and are trying to work to address it? Well, there's two aspects to housing affordability. One, in I was thrilled to see uh, Kamala Harris really come forward with a plan to remove barriers and uh, red tape around housing permitting. We've been pursuing the same uh, policies in, in Colorado, trying to allow more development by right and reducing uh, costs and, and getting government out of the way of increasing the housing supply. The other piece that the way people experience uh, housing costs is uh, really dependent on the mortgage rate and what their mortgage is. So lowering interest rates is key. So sound monetary policy, sound fiscal policy, uh, mortgage rates have come down uh, over the last six months and, and hopefully they'll continue that way. But that's a big aspect of housing affordability as well. You hear from voters in your state all the time um, about many different things, but when they talk about housing affordability, how much is housing prices and the ability to buy a house or maybe upgrade and get a larger house, how much is that, do you hear voters express their views of the economy through the housing market? You ever seen it's through, it's through costs, right? So it could, it, it, yes, housing is the single biggest cost that people have, whether it's mortgage or rent, it's, it's, it's the single biggest. After that, you have healthcare, uh, you might have car and automobile costs, you have groceries, but uh, on, on nearly every American's budget, their mortgage or rent is the single biggest line item. So of course people are attuned to that. The price of the home, the nominal price of the home is important. Is it 600,000, is it 800,000, is it 400,000? Right. But the mortgage interest rate is also important on what your monthly payments are. Right, and it just takes so long to really address those things. Is, is, it a, is there a way to message and let voters know, hey, it may take some time, but I hear you on this. Yeah, point. it's happening. So in Colorado, we, for instance, allow accessory dwelling units to be built by right. We have multifamily and in, in, in transit areas across our state. So these changes are happening. And uh, I think even building into the market, the expectation that the new housing is on the way uh, has an immediate impact in making housing more affordable. Another big issue for voters is uh, immigration. I'm curious, have you assessed the effectiveness of President Biden's executive order? It, are you able to tell a difference in your state, for example? Well, we had, a, you know, like many states, we had a, we have a workforce shortage. There's more job openings than there are unemployed people. So I've been a big proponent of him using his authority to give temporary protected status, TPS, to Venezuelans so that they can work while they're waiting for their asylum claims. And we have many Venezuelans that are already part of our workforce in Colorado filling critical jobs. And of course, we want to better align the needs of the private sector with uh, the desire of people to come here legally and work legally. And so we need more, in our case in Colorado, seasonal work permits, agriculture, ski industry, two important drivers in Colorado. We'd love to have increased numbers. Uh, and of course, um, people that want to make uh, America their forever home and have a skill that we need in the economy as well. Of course, at the same time, we've got to lock down the border and Democrats have been strong on border security. And frankly, there was a bipartisan border security moving through Congress till Donald Trump tanked it uh, because he seems to want to keep the border insecure for his own political purposes. Is there anything Kamala Harris could do maybe different than how President Biden has either governed on the border or messaged on the border? Is there, if you were to play political consultant, I guess, how would, what would your advice be to 
the new well Democrats the issue of immigration I, I think you know Democrats have always been at the table for uh, comprehensive immigration reform starting with border security but I think the key lesson is we should take what we can get done and if there's bits and pieces that we can do and can get through Congress that have Republican and Democratic support border security uh, you know addressing uh, seasonal work permits uh, EB5 investor visas I've been a big fan of there's a number of different categories and you know rather than all or nothing which has unfortunately led to nothing for decades um, let's see what we can agree on and let's get some important work done to secure the border and make our country more competitive another topic I wanted to ask you about was the uh, war in Gaza we've heard both sides of it here at the convention we've heard support for Israel and then we've also heard the desire to stop the humanitarian crisis in Gaza how do you think the party is doing in striking that balance? Well, look, um, I, I'd like to see nothing more, and I think the American people and, and most Israelis would want to see nothing more than a release of the hostages and a ceasefire. So, uh, of course, we care about the broader resolution of the conflict, the two-state solution, uh, the challenges that we have ahead with, with both Hezbollah as well as uh, future governance for the, 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 um, the Gaza Strip. But in the meantime, um, I hopeful that President Biden is successful in helping to negotiate a release of the hostages that leads to a, an immediate ceasefire. Final question, just do the vibes feel good? Does it feel like a, like the- People are excited, right? I mean, look- we're you having a brat convention? There's some, there's some anxiety there because we know that this thing is close, uh, but there's a great desire from the people who are assembled here to go back to their states and hit the ground, door to door, on the phones, doing the uh, nuts and bolts of politics that will all make sure that we win in November. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.